Uh, welcome everybody for joining us. We're going to start in just a minute or two. Uh, we will start with an introduction by Rick Bissell, who is Professor Emeritus in the UMBC Department of Emergency Health Services, and he will introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Betty Gabriel. Um, and then um, uh, we will post, uh, I, I'm going to show the slides. Uh, we had a little bit of technical difficulty. She's communicating with us from Haiti, um, where she uh, is, and um, we have what looks like a pretty clear, clear connection, but to save some of the technical uh, issues, I'm going to actually advance slides for her. Um, we are recording this seminar as we do with all of our seminars. The recording will be posted on the YouTube channel of the UMBC Center for Social Science Scholarship. So um, you'll have the ability to see it. Um, once we post it, I'll send out a follow up message uh, to anybody who's interested in watching it so that they can um, uh, view it in case they were not able to do us today. So without any further ado, I am going to turn over the floor to uh, Rick Bissell. Let me just get a second here to put you on stage. Okay, there we are. So both of you are on stage. So Rick, take it away. Excellent. <clears throat> well, thank you, uh, uh, Andy, for suggesting that I would give this introduction. Um, I first met Betty Gabrion when I was teaching several public health courses at the University of Connecticut and Wesleyan University. Uh, this was a little while ago. I think it was around 1984, 1985. <laughs> yeah. Betty was an energetic nursing student <laughs> whose goal was to improve the lives of other people due to no fault of their own. People who lack access to resources that contribute to good physical and mental health uh, were part of her goal. I had recently spent several years of research time in the Dominican Republic, Bolivia and Chile, and Betty wanted to know more about the lives and needs of many of the human beings living in dire, dire and difficult circumstances. My wife, Robin, was at that time a resident in family practice, and Betty came to our apartment several times to discuss and learn about our work with social justice groups, as well as my time in Latin America. Those were good times. I could see the gleam in Betty's eyes when discussing the concept of working abroad with populations in need. From my perspective, that was just the beginning. Somehow Betty discovered a Connecticut-based Haiti-centered volunteer health organization that brought health and medical supplies to some of the poorer areas of Haiti, as well as supplying hands-on health care when possible. She started volunteering with the group in an area of southwestern Haiti that receives little attention from the rest of the world. How Betty continued working with the Haiti program and completed an MPH at Johns Hopkins University and a PhD at the University of Connecticut, I cannot fathom. <laughs> Over the next 20 years or so, Betty managed to expand the work of the Haitian Health Foundation, marry a local Haitian and have two kids, provide expanding health services for people who never had a system they could rely upon, and conduct and publish significant public health papers in some of the most recognized organizations journals and conferences. Somewhere along the line, she parted with the Haitian Health Foundation and started her own organization, of which she is now the executive director of the Grand Ants Health and Development Association, with a huge range of activities, including clinical and medical services, agricultural methods, water management, earthquake preparedness, and schooling for children and adults. Betty also remains an active clinical assistant professor at the University of Connecticut. I've worked with numerous organizations on different continents, but it's very rare that I have found an NGO, a non-governmental organization, that is so phenomenally <clears throat> effective. This would not have come about without Dr. Betty Gabriel. I'm sure that you will be fascinated by her work, successes, and dreams. Hello. So I'm going to interrupt you just a second because I need to make sure I get the choreography on this right. I'm going to take Rick off the stage. 
yes. I'm going to share my screen and then I'm going to make sure you are featured and then I'll invite you to say everything that you want to say. So I apologize for interrupting. Um, okay. I need Thank to you, do Rick. One more thing, which is to put you on stage since I'm sh it, otherwise it's going to look like it's me presenting. So, oh. I can make you the presenter. If I make you the presenter, will I stop sharing screen? Sharing will end. I can't do that. So, um, Betty, we're going to leave you in the window. I don't know if I can control that anymore, but I'm going to start. I'm going to go to full screen mode. Can people see this? Okay. So, I'll just apologize in advance. This. this Seminar, uh, there was a version of this that was presented last October, just because we had a technical issue to begin with. I'm going to be sharing the slides. So Betty will let me know when she unlocks me to advance the slides. So now, Betty, say whatever you want. I will stop interrupting. <laughs> well, thank you so much for the invitation, Dr. Andy and Rick. Thanks so much for all the years of friendship, for your leadership, your mentorship, and for your fine introduction, although it's kind of weird to hear it. People talk about you. Anyway, I want to get on with it so that people can ask questions. Um, I am thrilled to be a part of this, and I hope it's helpful and interesting and helps me to keep on going. So we're going to talk about Haiti and it's res her resilience and recovery. Um, I already said who I am. Judy Lewis, who is also on this uh, first page, is my 30 plus year partner from the University of Connecticut. And we've done all of our research and we'll talk a little bit about her in a bit. So thank you very much. And next, next slide. This is what I'm going to talk about. Um, you'll be happy to know I don't read slides. I was trained by a very um, <clears throat> incredible um, PowerPoint person. So we're going to talk about Haiti and then Gata and what we do. So next. Um, I'm sure you know about Haiti uh, because of the uh, assassination of the president and also the, the earthquakes. But here's what here we are an hour and a half from Miami and a um, hundred years different in a lot of ways. Next. This is really important. I'm really hope no one ever says again, Haiti is the poorest country in the Western hemisphere. Actually, Haiti is part of Africa that happens to be geographically in our hemisphere. If you look and see where it sits, it really sits with Sub-Saharan Africa. And it's uh, statistics, uh, health, uh, and demographic uh, really are more like Chad. So, you know, people say, well, you know, why Haiti? And it's never, you know, anyway, that's just the way it is. So Haiti is Africa in our, in our backyard. Next. Certainly is a fragile state, and we know there are fragile areas in America as well. Um, and these uh, show you just how uh, bad it is, uh, poor it is. And um, it's the size of Maryland, just like you, but we have, I think you have 6 million people. We have 11 um, and a very young population. Uh, I hear that the global corruption ranking is actually worse now, now that there's no um, functional government. Next. Just some basic information. Um, there are two now official languages. It's not just French, but also Creole. And although most documents are in French, which um, basically puts off most of the population that does not read French. So when I came here as a nurse, I decided to speak only Creole because everyone speaks Creole. And it's the language of health and illness anyway. Women in labor are not oi oi oiing in French. They are certainly speaking Creole. It was predominantly a Catholic uh, country, but after the 2010 earthquake, uh, many Protestant um, sects came to, to Haiti, and now it really is, uh, I think, almost tipped the scales for Protestant, but very much a Christian country. Um, Haitian voodoo is an integral part of the culture, and we don't really know how many people uh, practice voodoo, but pretty much everybody believes that it exists. Uh, mostly farmers and fishermen. V low literacy actually has gotten better over time since I've been here, and young people... Uh, are actually more literate than their elders, which is a good thing. And it's extremely poor. 
if it wasn't for the remittances from people abroad, people would even be in worse shape. And with the, um, you know, 2008 uh, crash, with all the problems with COVID, people dying, Haitians dying in the States, remittances have um, been a problem. And also visitors aren't coming to Haiti. So it's, it's pretty tough. Okay, next. The history of Haiti is a uh, tumultuous one, but we're proud to say that it was the first um, slave revolt that was successful in 1804. And so um, we're very proud of that. But the instability that followed, because no one wanted to recognize Haiti as a free country because it put them and their slaves in bad stead. The Duvalier dictatorship was American occupation, of course, in 1915. That was the first time a president, I believe, was assassinated um, and before uh, our pres president uh, last year. Um, the UN came in uh, 1994 with all kinds of people. Um, the embargo, which had to do with the coup against President Aristide, uh, really disrupted aid. And I actually did a study on the impact of the embargo on the mortality rate of children, and it was significant. Um, and then the... Uh, President Martelli, who was a singer, was elected president. And then uh, Jovenel Moise, uh, of course, was assassinated in July, and the earthquake happened in August. Next. Um, yeah, the gangs are pretty much in control of Port-au-Prince, which has uh, a third of the population. They cut off the road between um, the capital and this whole part of the country. Um, people have found creative ways to get around it. We, there are no ships, though, coming out this way. Uh, lots of people have been kidnapped. Um, you, know, you hear mostly when foreigners get kidnapped, but a lot of patients as well. You know, physicians and lab people and priests and nuns. And I mean, there's no no one's safe. No one's safe. Except for out here, it's, you know, pretty much okay. Um, the general strike, because uh, fuel is now $10 a gallon. Um, has been going on. That was October 18th, but it's still very difficult. A lot of black market stuff going on. Um, next. All right, natural disasters, of which there have been many. Next. Okay, this is just an overview of what is going on. And it's important to note that um, Haiti, Port-au-Prince, was completely wiped out in the 1700s by a massive earthquake. And again, uh, the North in, uh, in the 1800s. But most recently, the earthquake in Port-au-Prince, uh, Hurricane Thomas, Matthew, and this new earthquake have really, um, you know, did a number on us. We did not know, in fact, out here that we were on the same fault line. I guess we just didn't pay attention. We were so used to fighting off, uh, you know, cholera and earthquake, uh, hurricanes that we didn't know. And I had never felt an earthquake or a tremor in my entire time here since the late 1980s. So let me tell you, we were pretty stunned. So this is what we have to go through. Next. Yep, and there's our fault line. Um, so, uh, you know, that's just the way it is. So there have been, uh, anyway, we'll get to that. This is our plate, our tectonic plate. Next. All right, the earthquake that really, you know, got the news and Anderson Cooper down here and Sanjay Gupta was um, the 2010 earthquake that really, we don't know how many people were actually killed um, because a lot of people were buried and people were unknown and that sort of stuff. So, but what's remarkable for us out here, if you look at that big red arrow, is that 120,000 people came our way. And at that time, as a provider and a manager of uh, 163,000 people, in the hands of village health workers. We had to uh, deal with people who were hungry, people who were injured. They had stood on a boat coming out 12 hour trip and arrived on the wharf with nothing, nothing. They didn't speak. Um, the trauma was so intense. Babies were handed off first when they arrived in Jeremy on all these boats. And then all were just put in under a little tent on the port. Can you imagine handing off all the newborns and infants and children first? And then the adults got off. Within hours, there was no one left on the port because everyone took people in. And so our challenge was to help them to survive and maybe go back, maybe stay, but deal with the trauma. Next. 
Then, of course, we have our this her this earthquake, uh, which we didn't expect, hit at eight o'clock in the morning on the 14th, and we've had tremors ever since. There is a uh, uh, continuing trauma. A lot of people who felt this earthquake or were in this earthquake were also in Port-au-Prince for the 2010. And the earthquake was also felt in Port-au-Prince and Laogan, other places where the other one had occurred. So it's just a renewed trauma um, that we're still dealing with. And um, we, I mean, I slept in the car, you know, slept on the floor and um, it's, we just don't know if we'll get a big one. Okay, next. Oh, I'm not sure if you can do this. I, maybe it won't play, but this is the earthquake. And this is a, play, oh, it will. This is, a, this is a building called Tech for Kids. And I just want to note that those doors on the right, those metal doors were permanently wedged in the cement so they couldn't open or close. So just watch this. It's like 30 seconds. It's the, it's I the don't know if this, I don't know if you hear the sound, but you'll be able to watch it, I think. So let's okay. See. No. Oh yeah, here it comes. And none of us could run. You couldn't run because it was, you couldn't stand up. So it was my first experience with a category, with a category, with a um, magnitude 7.2 earthquake. This building was well built, brand new. Americans came down, they're teaching kids. That's it, 30, 30 seconds. and. Many, 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 many people died. And a lot were never found, which is really hard. So that's, that's our earthquake. Next. Now this one's a little more graphic. It's extremely mountainous in this area. And so um, rocks, rock slides and landslides did a number on uh, not only roads, but also water sources. Now, uh, you want to want to play this little one? This is real short. Yeah. The thing about this is there's no warning. And um, these continued tremors have also continued with um, landslides and rock slides. And when you think about it, blocking natural springs that come out of the rocks. People had no water. It was just unbelievable. Okay, next. So this is the impact, you know, as of October. And um, basically 800,000 people were affected. Um, and it was, um, we've had aftershocks up to a magnitude of five. And that's significant. Um, being from Connecticut and not ever being used to an earthquake. So um, people then, there were lots of people who were injured. Um, a lot of people were carried to the hospital. Some people never made it to the hospital until medical teams went up to these rural areas, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Okay, next. So um, the picture on the right is, an, is a rock, lower right is the rock slide. Um, I'm not sure if you could, I don't think you can play this one. Um, the, the, the center one on the bottom, see if you can, oh Sorry. no. Okay. So the bottom one is people sleeping on the ground. Now in the Haitian culture, sleeping outside is not something you want to do ever. If you're in a house in a rural area, all the doors and windows are closed up tight at night because of the belief in uh, supernatural, uh, events that occur, um, due to, uh, voodoo spirits. And so for people to be outside and sleeping is just so against what they're brought up to and really cr creates even more uh, trauma. But I did talk to a voodoo priest who said, you know, we lost in our ranks as well. So they suspended their um, nighttime terror for the duration, and then they'll pick it up sometime in the future. <laughs> I thought that was great. So on the left is a, the rest of the, the house that's left over. And on the bottom, on the island of Kaimi, which was flooded because we think it sank a bit, you know, the walls came down and it's really just, you know, rock and a little bit of cement. Um, but I think it's 160,000 houses are down. And uh, the top right is a river, which is now a lake, which is awful because people 
take little um, bamboo rafts down the river to bring their their harvest to market. So because this mountains collapsed, the river was blocked. So everything has even more of an impact and a long-term impact. So next. All right, so this hurricane, Matthew, if you look at the circle in the center, it was the only hurricane in Haiti in 2016, but um, it was really bad. And we saw it coming. We knew it was coming. There was nothing we could do. And unfortunately, people didn't understand the eye of the hurricane um, and left their houses or left their the caves. People went in caves. People hung out in uh, uh cemeteries because that was the only place there was cement to uh, beat the winds and um people that went out during the the eye then were killed by flying tin which is the predominant way people do their uh, cover their houses so um it was you know when i was here all our roofs were ripped off power was gone um but my husband being the man of many trades was able to get us up and running so we could help others next. So yeah, 2 million people were affected. 90% of this area was devastated. So there was no leaves on any trees. It then rained for six weeks. So you couldn't light a fire to cook food and there was no food to be had. It was so many people became malnourished and so many children died because there was just not any food or way to cook it. And then it took, and in fact, the six weeks of rain washed, you know, washed the, uh, what do you call it? The seawater salts into the ground and actually it became more fertile, but that wasn't for many, many, many months. So um, people brought in what they could. There was a, a, a large outpouring of support but some people still, and what we did as an organization is we removed um, houses for 3,000 people. We gave them tin, cement, and nails, and they rebuilt themselves. Um, and, and that's it. But there was, um, okay, so a lot of people didn't even finish recovering their houses from 2016 and then 2010 hit and took down whatever they had left. Next. Yeah, so that's a that's a real house before and after, you know, similar houses. Uh, but truth be told, thatched roofs are the most safe during an earthquake or hurricane because the wind goes right through it. <coughs> so you see on the right that um, house, the roof is still okay. So <laughs> I was actually thinking of maybe doing more uh, thatched roofs, but people still like cement. Next. All right, this is the hospital. This is the hospital built in 1923 by the American Army that's still used as the medical wards for men and females, both separated into uh, wings, just wiped out, wiped out. Um, took a long time to rebuild it. Um, next. All right, the health situation in this area. Let's take a look at that. All right, you're supposed to have about 23 health people per 10,000 population. Yeah, we have nine. <laughs> um, so we're re way behind in what's expected. There's very little input into healthcare by the government. Actually, the Minister of Health was just here yesterday. I'm not sure why he was here, but um, just an overnight trip. That was the first trip of a um, government official um, in a long time since we were here um, and since the uh, assassination. So it's it's a very fragile health infrastructure. Next. So as you would expect, people rely on, use, and we support the traditional healing system. As a medical anthropologist, it was essential to understand the uh, relationship between illness, worldview, the work of traditional birth attendants, voodoo priests, etc., in order to provide maternal and child care, which is what I was doing at the time through these village health workers. Come to find out 25% of people who deliver babies in the mountains are men. 
And that's because they will go out at night while women won't to deliver babies. And some of them are voodoo priests. So in some places, people will say, come to Haiti and say, oh, we're not going to work with voodoo, you know. I'm like, well, then you're cutting off a maternal child health care. So not a wise thing to do. The average age of a traditional birth attendant is 40. And they go into their high 90s. Herbalists are extremely important. Many of the treatments and the concoctions have been done since um, Africa. And for COVID, um, they've become even more important um, with their traditional uh, treatments. And so I have learned a lot and work with them as a matter of fact, and I'll get, I'll get to how they're integrated still with us next. Okay, so the resources, as you know, the personnel are quite limited. There is the government hospital, you saw the picture. There is another picture, a newer wing that is uh, functional. I think there are 70 something beds, um, one operating room, no anesthesiologist. Nurse anesthetists do all the anesthesia. That's it. If you can't do it that way, you can't have surgery, which is terrible and trauma. So um, there are uh, public and private health centers run by churches or um, you know, Catholic churches, Protestant churches. Um, there are private clinics, not so many. There's a limited radiology and lab for sure. Um, so we brought in actually um, um, sickle cell, sickle cell screening, and we're going to be doing that more. Um, so, so the, there's a physician that manages the health agents, and then there's a there's bilateral, multilateral, and local support for either a health the health system or particular illnesses like HIV AIDS or um, maternal child health. There are now six nursing schools because people want their kids to be educated. There's not enough jobs for all those nurses, but um, it has helped to increase the number of nurses that are available and employed in this area. So I'm happy about that. Next. So the town has about 55,000 people. At this point, that picture on the left, those houses aren't even there anymore. The earthquake, they all came down, all came down, including my, you know, the houses built, you know, um, out of, uh, what do you call it, um, cast iron that were brought in in 1802 and had these beautiful buildings downtown, you know, all gone. So on the right, this is me uh, on a mule going up with a, one of the many medical teams that have come here to provide care either in a clinic setting or out in rural, um, you know, cockfight arenas or in a little chapel, southern or under a tree, that sort of thing. The picture of the town is on the right. Um, as you might expect, we're now getting ready to do tsunami warning and also um, a seismic uh, monitoring system because everybody lives by the, you know, by this, not everybody, a lot of people live by the sea though. And that fishing is a, a also a, a way that people survive and have a job, but they fish close to the shore. So, um, you know, the takings are pretty slim. Next. How am I doing for time? Am I okay? Okay, God is our organization. Um, I was working, doing a lot of stuff in addition to or on the side of my regular job in uh, public health and came to understand ab about the critical importance of relationships and trust and developing these partnerships for healthcare. And so we decided to do because I had done a lot with breastfeeding and we got the breastfeeding rate up to 80% for the exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months and a couple thousand women. So we started, we started finding breast cancer and there's no breast cancer care here. There's no mammography. There's no biopsy, no surgery. Women with fibroadenomas or cysts can have those removed, but you know, really bad. And our youngest uh, woman who died uh, having found her uh, breast cancer and when she was pregnant, died at age 24. So this is what we decided to do. We also do uh, development, education, and emergency relief, as you might expect. We spend a lot of time now in emergency relief. Next. 
So um, by working with uh, churches, we've done a lot for education, also, you know, partnered with people in Port-au-Prince. The surgeons that came from Connecticut and Mississippi, the breast surgeons um, aren't coming now because of COVID and the insecurity of the country. However, you know, skipping in from Fort Lauderdale to Port-au-Prince and Port-au-Prince to Jeremy, I mean, we're in the Maryland, we're the, we're the Wisconsin of Haiti. There's, it's pretty safe out here and great need, but nobody's coming. So we work with Global Health Teams, a great organization out of uh, San Diego, and we work, as I said, work in expanding what's not available for others, like A1C testing for, for you know, diabetics and things like that. Next. So um, because I've been on faculty with the School of Nursing and then uh, continually with the Department of Public Health Sciences, we have engaged students that have informed the work we do and improved it immeasurably. These are MPH students, uh, medical students, we had nursing students, anthro students, uh, PhD students um, that have done really excellent work um, in, I mean, let me see, where do I go? Syphilis, maternal syphilis, we did, you know, work on that. Using soccer and sexuality as a way to uh, engage girls and for girls soccer, and that was uh, really successful. Um, other other work on, um, uh, I can't remember. Anyway, <laughs> we've done a lot. But the students were excellent. They all stayed here. It was safe. And we've had, uh, re our most recent research has been on the worldview of breast cancer in men and women. So you can just look up my name and you'll see uh, a lot of collaborative research uh, that has been made practical. Next. So my husband had built this building that wasn't being used. So he donated it to GADA to be uh, rehabbed by um, an organization that gave us some money into um, our center for screening, sonog sonography, biopsy, and storage of surgical supplies for when they come. So thanks. That's a nice gift. Next. Okay, our partners are many from the government to private physicians um, that work in town, uh, international organizations. Knitted knockers is great. They uh, We get these um, knitted things that we put stuffing in and sew different size um, beads in so people can actually learn how to palpate for, for breast cancer. That was pretty innovative. And so, I mean, just work with all kinds of really neat people. Avera does all of our biopsies for free. Um, biopsy pathology, excuse me, pathology, and Hartford Hospital does the ER receptor. So that's wonderful if we can get the samples to the states. There's only four pathologists in the whole country of Haiti, and they only do limited pathology. Next. So um, being a good public health person and anthropologist, it didn't take long to figure out that the most stable social structure in Haiti is its churches. Catholic, Protestant, voodoo, doesn't matter, but people are very faith-centered and it is a strong social um, as well as spiritual foundation of community life. <clears throat> so that's who we've worked with. Next. I'll tell you about these women. So we also worked in, in getting uh, medical you know, physicians uh, more training, training physicians and nurses in clinical breast exam. Uh, training other nurses as volunteers to train people in their churches or clinics in, in self-breast exam. We're developing a film in Creole. And we have, you know, those old cards they had where it showed you how to do a breast exam on a laminated card. Well, we did one in Creole, which is because most people, not many people, not most, many people don't read. So we made it a pic pictograph. So that's good. So we have developed this system of 150 vol uh, community volunteers church volunteers that um, have been finding women with breast cancer, give us a call. We bring them in and we pay for their care. Next. So this is an example of training. Um, there is no training in medical school and very little in nursing school about breast cancer, um, but there's no national norms or standards. And it's just, that's just the way it is. So. Uh, the lower left is uh, uh, Dr. Duge, our medical director, who's also a volunteer. By the way, there's four of us. <laughs> there's four of us here in Jeremy that run GADA, including Dr. Duge. 
Um, and that's why we're a conduit. We're not actually a clinic. So that we do the training. That's Dr. Duje up there. Down below are physicians um, and nurses getting their, their diplomas. On the right, this is really good. This is a village health worker and also a, cha a Catholic chapel director showing men how they can help their wives do self-breast exam. Very popular. Went very well. Next. So we also made a database, which never existed before, of all the all the you know religious organizations, uh, not just the churches, but also um, like old folks homes and um, places for children, you know, stuff like that. So we have uh, all that information. It became critical during COVID uh, to help um, get the word out, and 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 because surprisingly, everybody has cell phones out here. They might not have any minutes on them, but they have cell phones. You can actually send information out. So we've used that as well. But having this database has been exceptional, especially after the earthquake. So this was developed, you know, for cancer, but we used it for, for COVID and we've used it for uh, recovery from the earthquake. Next. So COVID, um, you know, I'm not going to really go into this too much. You only find what you test for. So if there's no testing, you know, you're not going to find a whole lot. Um, for the most part, people who have died, because I talked to the epidemiologists out here, have been people with comorbidities. You know, people who were already diabetic or a heart disease, they didn't, they didn't fare very well. No reason to go to the hospital. The only thing they have um, is oxygen, no, uh, you know, the only respirator is the um, ventilator in the operating room. And that goes off when the power goes off at six o'clock. So <laughs> you're not going to go anywhere to get any care for COVID out here. So what, you know, so what people um, did and are still doing is making the concoctions that they use in Africa, which is ginger, asosi, amwaz, all these different herbs, and they drink it uh, every day and, not a whole lot of not a whole lot of people have been dying. Uh, there have been some, you know, there have been some young people who've died and stuff, but not so many. Um, surprisingly, because everybody's in the market, they can't mask up. Even though we give masks, they can't wear them in the market. You know, they're all close to each other. And anyway, next. So we do have the variant. Um, there is some uh, vaccines being administered mostly to health providers. It's okay. Um, it's not mandatory. And there's three sites, but you'll notice by the arrows, they're all on the shore. So it's hard for people to get down to those. But, you know, it's Johnson & Johnson. And as I said, equally men and women. Um, not a lot. Not a lot. <laughs> as of October and not a lot now either. Next. So we did a study and talked to these uh, religious leaders about what they knew, and it was very little. So utilizing this resource of churches of all types for uh, education, for health, has not really been exploited. And so we really took it upon ourselves to understand what they knew, what they wanted to know, and then commenced to send out as much educational material um, to uh, church leaders as possible and community leaders as well. Next. So you see this little singer machine, singer sewing machine? Thousands, thousands of masks were sewn by hand, which was a good thing because it made, gave people a job. These uh, face shields were also made locally. So we went around and distributed to 56 uh, clinics uh, these, you know, protective things, you know, gloves and masks and stuff like that. And so we spent a lot of time delivering stuff um, to providers, really helping the providers to be safe so they could take care of people as best they could. Next. And to the student nurses um, who give a lot of the care in the hospital, they also they got their visors. Next. The prison. Yeah. It's another thing, 450 men, most, mostly men, about 12 women. So during COVID, we started uh, supplying water and soap and things like that to the prison. And we've just continued that on. There are 450 prisoners and we just gave food the other day as well. Um, you know, we're, we're meant to take care of people who can't. Um, next. 
Food insecurity. Oh. You see, this is July 2020. 45% of people in the Grand Dons were food insecure. By May of 2021, before the assassination, it was up to 50%. We don't know what it is now, but it's clearly awful. So um, we I'll tell you what we do about this. As, as little as we can, um, as little as is possible, because we can't help everybody. But next, a lot of people are doing stuff for food. So what we're doing is we give goats to female-headed households. Um, we work with organizations that have flown or trucked in uh, rapid cooking food, even though that's not my preferred way of helping people eat. Rather, the lower right-hand picture are food rations, um, which I'll show you in a minute, food rations that we delivered to elders and handicapped very quietly um, so as not to create jealousy or to have a problem. Now, these women on the right are at the Missionaries of Charity Center, and they're like happy as can be because again, they got some food and they don't get, um, you know, robbed or anything for the most part. This is downtown Jeremy. We, we send out food by motorcycle to remote rural areas. Next. So, <laughs> yeah, our response to the earthquake um, and remembering that victims are also responders. It's not like people are coming in. You know, nobody came in because you couldn't come in unless it was the U.S. Red um, Coast Guard evacuating people who were critically injured to Port-au-Prince or um, missionary flights bringing in medical supplies. But there was, again, no boats coming in. It was people left to fend as best they could themselves initially. And then we did our best to be a pipeline of aid. So very generous people gave us um, money. Things were bought, purchased in Port-au-Prince. Flights were paid for to ship stuff out. Then you had to be careful getting it from the airport to our house here. Everything went to our personal home, which is, you know, well, you know, it's got a wall around it, you know. Um, so we could distribute it to as many people as possible to hard to reach areas. Um, these medical teams were fabulous. Young physicians, um, mostly educated in Cuba who came back. It was their promise that they would come back to their own town and help. And they did. And so we support them with uh, medical supplies and they've uh, treated now, I think uh, 10,000 people consultations and they're starting up again. Next. Yeah. So this is, this is an example in this period of time, what we had given out, there's no, there's no building. So people are still living under tarps, but hygiene kits were actually good. Um, you know, masks of course, and kits for these doctors and they just keep going up. They go on the, they go up on the weekends. They go up for two days. Some walking four or five hours. It's, I don't know how they do it. I used to do it no more. Okay. Next. The hospital, um, because of COVID, right? They made the tent outside the hospital to receive the injured and Medicine Sans Frontier came in, bless their hearts, with their entire surgical setup, surgeons, anesthesiologists, medicine, physical therapists, you know, everything, and uh, stayed for two months and helped to train, uh, retrain or not train, continuing education for the physical therapist. And there's the Coast Guard bringing out um, critically injured people to Port-au-Prince for trauma care. Now, the issue with that is that they flew them to Port-au-Prince, but there was no way to get them back. There was no plan to get them back. So they called me and said, you know, there's like these, you know, 20 patients that were, you know, have all these, you know, broken bones or whatever injuries. They need to come back by bus for, I think, seven hour bus trip back to this area. How, how are they going to do that? So, of course, we're here to do that kind of stuff. We rented the bus and they drop people off on the road as close to their own village as possible. Next. All right, so, you know, I told you that in their building, we stock surgical supplies, but the surgeons aren't coming. So we ended up taking all that stuff out and giving it away. That ration on the top is what um, local women decided was a really good month long family ration with leeks and sugar and oil, rice, beans, um, um, what do you call it? Cornmeal, uh, spices, sugar, and then some money for, 
for cooking. And people just, most people just cried. We went to one pe person, actually I didn't go, it was bad for me to go because then they think everybody was gonna get food in the village. Um, but one woman, all she had to eat was a potato and salt. That was it, that was it. Not even any oil to cook anything in. So we try to do this as much as possible. It's $70 to do this kind of ration for a family. Uh, the average Haitian family in rural areas has six people. It keeps them going for a while. Those buckets came from Project Metashare in Florida. Those are hygiene, no, those are food kits. And then they reuse the buckets for, you know, water. And that's us planning. That's, that's you know, the team. <laughs> Next. All right, so Cross Catholic Outreach in Florida was amazing. They uh, stocked stuff in Port-au-Prince, sent it out to my house. You know, my living room became a depot. I love the pictures on the right. Oh, the center one is one of the physicians mapping out his rural um, trips with volunteer nurses as well and health agents. Um, and they generally would see 200 patients a day. The rural clinic up here is all the medicine that we were able to provide this particular clinic. And uh, it's in a very remote area. And uh, so the, and some prenatal care up there uh, in the picture on the top right. Very, very productive work. Next. Uh, when redoing more educational material, people, uh, they're in Creole and um, over there, you know, contacting the churches, we have our major list to see who needs what, what's happening hiring young people to sort and pack and getting water to the hospitals, clean water to the hospital for patients and staff. Next. So breast cancer continues. I'm going to stop soon. Um, we don't have seven women. I think we're now following 30 women in various stages of breast cancer or, or other breast issues. And um, the earthquake has actually helped us find more, as I mentioned, and we still hope to do more. So that's our, that's our real mission. Thank you. Next. So going forward, more of the same, more breast cancer care, promoting community engagement always and collaboration, transparency, flexibility. Haitians are unbelievable. They sing while they're cooking. I mean, I could barely talk after the earth cooking. They're singing, right? Haitians are resilient and we should be too. Next. And life goes on. This is our broken bridge built in 1950 by President Estime. One truck stops on one side of the bridge. People walk the stuff over into another truck and life goes on. And I wanna say about just before we end that Rick Bissell was so uh, instrumental during, I didn't say it earlier and I should have, during the um, earth, no, the hurricane, the hurricane, because so many people had uh, wounds and tetanus and there was no tetanus anti-serum, you know, tetanus immune globulin. And Rick, I, I tried everywhere. I tried the CDC. I tried um, all, everybody I knew, people who worked, you know, in any sort of medical care. The only person able to get me SAT um, was Rick Bissell. And he got it in uh, cooler bags to Jeremy to save the lives of people. Didn't happen in 2021 and people died of tetanus. This is something that we all need to work on. You can't get you, to die of tetanus from a wound an hour and a half from Miami, really? Anyway, that's it. Next. Thanks, Rick. And so thank you. That's my view from my um, porch uh, overlooking Jeremy and the sea. And I thank you for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for caring. And on we go. So I... Um... That was just extraordinary. And I just want to thank you for being with us. I'm going to invite people to post questions in the chat. Um, and let me, okay, I'm going to invite people to post questions in the chat. 
We will call on you in the order in which the questions appear. So I'm going to let people uh, give people a couple of minutes to do that. Um, and um, Betty has uh, generously agreed that if people want to talk for a little bit longer than the one o'clock uh, normal ending time, she's willing to do that. If you have questions you want to raise, uh, I just want to say while we're waiting for things to appear, uh, I have a couple of people to thank. I I um I did not know Betty at a time, and I knew Rick, but I didn't. I, I basically last August after the earthquake and knowing about the, uh, the assassination and the health issues and everything, I thought we need to find some way to find someone who can bring this story to us and talk about it to bring some understanding. And um, I think it might have been Jeff Hallers in our department that said you should talk to Lucy Wilson in emergency health services. And I contacted Lucy. She put me in touch with Betty. We didn't manage to have the seminar last fall. A lot going on last fall, so it might not have been the best for her anyway. We finally got her here. I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, you know, resilience. I mean, um, all we hear mostly in this country about what goes on in Haiti is the stories of devastation and, and terrible things going on. You presented a picture that to me tells us something very different to watch you and your team and the things that you've done for people in the face of such disaster and to just keep going, no matter what the challenge is, I think it's a lesson for all of us. I am gonna ask you after we're done with this to send me an email with a list of where people can donate if they want to help. Um, and we'll try to disseminate that. You know, there, This is not a huge crowd on this uh, seminar, but we are gonna actually share the uh, video with a lot more people and hopefully, you know, I can't promise what the result from that will be, but I think this just shows people what you can do. So I'm gonna ask you, so the next, so we had a nice comment from Bridget Starkey, um, which just said wonderful presentation. My heart is warm over the support that you provide on the ground, Betty and Aaron Hamner, you have a question. So would you uh, just unmute and ask your question? Erin, are you there? Yeah. yeah, sorry. Could you repeat that? Yeah, just you asked a question. So basically, we just call on people who post the question to oh. actually ask you in person. Oh, okay. That's fine. Hi, my name is Erin. Um, I just want to say first, thank you for the amazing presentation. It was really lovely to hear all the work that you guys do and all the help you've been providing. But I wanted to ask a question in reference to, I guess, like the beginning of your presentation when you said Haiti was like an extension of Africa or was a part of Africa. I don't know if you meant like geographically or like culturally, like could you, just, I guess, expand on that one more time what you meant by that? Well, everybody sees Haiti as, you know, the poor, you know, the poor country in the Western hemisphere and uh, it's the poorest country. And when you look at the health and demographic indicators for Haiti, they are most like sub-Saharan African countries. And it's been a while since I looked it up, but I think the last time I looked at um, Africa, I think we were closest to Chad in terms of longevity, um, infant mortality rate, per capita income, um, things like that. So if you look just at what the um, reports are of the country compared to others, we are really a sub-Saharan African country that happens to be in our hemisphere. That's why. Not in, in, in addition, people are here from Africa, you know, and still talk about Guinea and, you know, their connectedness to the, some of the traditions of their African ancestors. But it was mostly about health statistics. Okay, thanks. So the floor is open. Do people have other questions? At this point, rather than put it in the chat, you can just unmute and ask because, uh, Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I had a quick question uh, just regarding the political system in Haiti and some of the political turmoil there. Um, do you think that um, as you tackle some of the health issues that are currently present there, that there is room for any type of unified um, 
or unity across the, the country? Because it seems as though that's one of the things that could possibly bring people together. Well, we certainly hope that that's possible. Um, we, you know, I think at this point we should leave Haiti to Haitians and not um, get too involved in trying to fix it. And I think they need to, I remember Rick once said in, in lecture, if, you know, people want to have, they kicked out all the foreigners and took the hands, you know, their country by the collar and moved forward, then that's what needs to happen. We've been here before. I mean, we were here in the beginning of the 1900s. We were here for the American occupation in 1915 and 2014. So who's to say, who's to say? It's really tough. It's really tough, but you know, There's really two Hades, and I really need to say this. There's two Hades. There's the Republic of Port-au-Prince, and there's Haiti. I live in Haiti. The Republic of Port-au-Prince, I used to work there. I mean, I used to go there, work there, drive there. I only pass through on a plane now. But we're in, like I said, the Wisconsin of Haiti. It's safe out here. Kids are going to school. We have the out takes of no fuel and stuff, but it's not like dangerous like that because nobody cares about anything outside of Port-au-Prince. So it's almost better that people don't care about it out here. Hard to say. I'm here for the long haul, so we'll see. I have hope. The floor is open. Anybody else want to ask a question or say something? Yeah. Uh, Robin, um, I'm a friends with Haiti or with, with Betty years ago but um my question was how do you get by the language barrier uh since most people speak creole or french um and you have volunteers coming in uh how have you dealt with that and what kind of limitation is that uh-huh great question robin in fact it's a great way to engage intelligent Haitians in the area for them to be trained in English so that medical English so that they, they can get a job. So they have jobs as translators for medical teams and they're really good. Um, you know, they get corrected if they're not, but it's, it's, it's another jobs creation um, uh, situation and they do a great job. Now, when most people that come here, of course, only speak English, but you know, Haitians want to speak English. So they'll, test that out too, but to get medical care given is translator. I would think it would be a good resource for volunteers coming in to be able to learn more about the culture too by asking mm -hmm. questions. Absolutely. And they do, they have a chance to just talk. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a good relationship. I think Maggie Holland had something to say. Maggie? Sure. Hi, buddy. Um, thank you for your presentation and for all the work um, that you've been doing. Uh, I had a chance to, I was living in um, the Dominican Republic uh, back in 2007 for a couple of years. And, um, and my husband was working um, actually in both countries. So he would, he would spend most of his time actually in, in Haiti. Uh, and so we got to know both places quite well. Um, and something that has always stuck with me was the, the sort of the tension um, between the two countries, and I'm I'm just wondering and reflecting on the time you've been there, what your what your observations are now as to sort of DR Haiti relations. Uh, you know, there were times when the DR would, in more recent you know natural disasters, times of natural disasters, the DR would offer some assistance. But I'm I'm curious as to what the state of the relationship is at this moment. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know. I'm on the other end of the country. So um, I have very little experience with the border. I do know that um, not only did the Dominican Republic, but also I think Honduras uh, sent uh, uh, Marine uh, uh, Navy ships of food um, here. Um, in a lot of cases, uh, Haitians are in Dominican Republic and not particularly welcomed. 
Um, yeah, it's, yeah. You know, they murdered a lot of Haitians. There's a lot of bad blood there. Um, you know. Yeah, I should I should say it was outright racism in, in the DR. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Deserved. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Yeah, sorry I don't have more information, but I can, I can barely handle where I am, never mind the DR. But yeah, it's not it's not you know, it's not so good. No. So we are at 102. Um we're pretty close to being done, I think. If someone has a last question they want to ask. I welcome you to do that now. I'll just read a comment from Christopher Schumann, who actually for a living studies uh, the, the fate of glaciers in Antarctica. So he says, uh -huh. best wishes to you and all your good people, truly inspiring. My daughter worked as a translator for medical team in the, in the medical Republic a number of years ago. So does anybody have anything they, they wanna add? I'll add my email, our, our uh, website, I, so that if anybody wants to donate, yeah. that would be so, great. What, what I'm going to do, rather than ask you to put that in the chat right now, I wanted this to go out to everybody who's on our um, email list. So I'm going to ask you to send me, I have your email address, of course, send me that, send me the website, and send me, you know, uh, just a brief, these are the places that, in addition to your organization, of course, that have done, that are most effective. I mean, it's stunning to see what you're able to do with just the resources you're able to, to pull together. And I think people need to know that this is happening on the ground and a little bit of help can actually go quite a long way mm -hmm. rather than just wringing your hands and saying nothing can be done. So right. Right. You're thank right. you so much for bringing this to us. And we will try yep, to disseminate sure. this. I'm sure some people want to use this video or clips from it in their classes. I think this has really been a valuable uh, addition to our understanding and hopefully maybe people can give back a little bit too. So thank you Excellent. so much. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for attending and uh, hope to see you again. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna stop the recording now.